Hello and welcome to our first worldwide webinar, Tips and Tricks for DocuWare Administrators. My name is Matthias Wieland. I'm responsible for the customer support in the EMEA region and I'm your host of this webinar today. I'm really proud that we have been able to bring such a huge audience together from all over the world today. I have to admit, I'm also a bit nervous because this is by far our biggest webinar event so far, uh, so far, so we have around 300 registrations. Let's see how many will join during the webinar. What can you expect today? So we want to enhance your knowledge of DocuWare and its modules, and we want to transfer most current tips, tricks, Heinz, known issues, workarounds, and solutions directly from our support teams here to you. We want to enable you to solve these problems by your own, and we want to help you to understand how to configure and maintain your DocuWare system in the best possible way. Well, calling it the first webinar shows that we have planned something more to do it somehow regularly. I have to admit it's not so clear how often we will do it in the future. This depends from your feedback, but we are planning to have it at least at minimum two sessions a year but completely independent from any DocuWare release or any DocuWare version at all. When collecting the topics for today, we have found a lot of them. Much more we can present in this webinar today. And we are always open for your ideas and topics for the next webinars we will do. We are really interested in. Just let us know. Use the feedback functionalities of the GoToWebinar client today, send us an email, or just call us and let us know what you want to hear next. For today, we have selected these most current topics you can see now, and let's go ahead with the first session. But before we start, I will want to introduce the webinar team to you. Well, you know me already. That's fine, and here are your presenters of the day. It's Juan Tenemaza from the America support team, and it's Sebastian Krieger from the EMEA support team. Both are doing trainings for our partners and customers, beside the daily challenges in our support teams here. So I really think we are well prepared, and we have a lot of knowledge on stage today. Welcome, Juan. Juan, are you there? Yep. Thank, thank, thank you, Matthias. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. And some of the can, uh, countries. Buenos dias. Buenas tardes. Welcome to this webinar. Thanks. And hello, Sebastian. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks, Matthias. Also, a warm welcome from my side to all the attendees. Thanks a lot. Additionally, we have a Q&A team in the background, which is available for any kind of your questions you may have during the webinar. We will try to answer it directly today. Most of the relevant questions, which are hopefully related to the topics um, we are presenting today, will be collected by, the, by Gerardo Lisanti and his team in the background. During um, two Q&A sessions, he will then ask these questions directly to the presenters. Welcome to you, Gerardo. Yeah, hi, Dave. Thanks. Looks like this is working. Okay, you may think now, how can I ask any question at this webinar? Well, that's really easy. You can use the GoToWebinar question functionality in the panel. You can find it on the bottom in the GoToWebinar panel. Just type in any kind of questions and we'll get it directly in our Q&A team here. And before we will start with the webinar, I want to do a, sh a small check of this Q&A functionality together with you. So my question is, can you tell me from which city you are connected today? Just type in the answer in the question, just type in the, your answer in the question area, and I will check if this is working. Grüß Gott to Munich. Hello, St. Louis. Hello, Houston. Wow, there are a lot of answers coming in. Welcome to Trier. Welcome to Kansas City. Hallo nach Rostock. Hallo nach Dresden. Welcome Warschau. Well, that's looking really 
like it's working. Thank you very much for your participation. And now let's start with the first tips and tricks session. Juan, please take over now. Okay. Okay, well, uh, welcome to my webinar. Again, this is Juan from DocuWare Corporation, the Support Americas. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate some of the tips and tricks in DocuWare. I'm going to start on one of my virtual machines here. Uh, I am going to start with my, one of my first topics. One of my first topics is going to be how to collect log data. When we're talking about log data, we're talking about, you know, system logs, we're talking about maybe user access logs and things of that nature. Okay, so where are the logging files located and how to gather them? Okay, now you may ask, why do we need this? From time to time, there might be some unexpected behaviors in the system. Maybe you want to track some type of activity in the system and things of that nature. So to track these activities, to be able to catch this, you know, we have some built-in programs, built-in functions that we can use in DocuWare to be able to track these errors or this log information. There's also things within the Docker administration that you can enable to be able to gather such information. Uh, now, I'm going to open up Docker administration. Now, we may ask, where is the default location? The default location, I'm going to show you somewhere here. I'm going to open up Docker administration. Log in with my account. In Docker administration, if you don't know where the log files are located or what's the default location, Docker has a unique place where all the log data is stored. This is the default location. Now, this is the default location for log files for client path. When we're talking about clients, we're talking about desktops. We're talking about desktop apps and things of that nature. Server logs. This is where you store all the server logs, server-related logs, so we're able to see the behavior that's causing the system either to malfunction or you just want to see how it's working the system. Okay? So those are the locations. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to go to this location now just for demonstration purposes. Copy, go to star, run, or you can open Windows Explorer and just type that path again. Go to that location and press enter. Okay. In this location, you see I have a few logs here. You know, a typical scenario will be, let me maximize this for a second. There you go. Oops. I'm sorry about that. Let me press enter. There you go. Okay. No. Okay, sorry about that. I was trying to maximize the screen, but I think I got it. So in this location, we have all the log files. Now, in a typical scenario, you may want to take this file. Let's go in here and say, I want to see what error messages I'm getting. Like this one here, for example. You can open up with the, you know, this notepad, default notepad, and look at it. Maybe you see some errors that make sense. Maybe you see some errors that make no sense. But this is where everything is written if something will start. Now, for demonstration purpose in this presentation, I have I have killed, you can say it will stop a uh, workload engine. Now, we can see here that it says that this is a wrong version of database. I did this purposely, therefore it won't start. So now, there's also a tool that was provided, or we, it comes with every Docker 6.10 version that we can look at it here, and, we, and this is located on C drive, program files, DocuWare. Let's go down to setup components, and here we should have a what we call the log viewer, the DW log viewer. If I open this up, just a simple application, but I'm going to show you what else can you see with this particular log viewer. Now I'm going to go back to my old location. I'll use profile, same thing, program data, document, logs. I can take this file, drop it into this log viewer. You'll see what comes up and look at what's here. Now, here you can sort, you can categorize or filter based on a specific error that you're getting. 
based on a specific date. Maybe you had an issue on, let's say, on Tuesday or something like that. You can click on that and see what errors were then Tuesday. Or maybe you want to go specific down to a time, you know, things like that. Okay? We can also here customize this a little bit. But maybe I want to say event type or something like that, the event type. Or I think there was another issue message log level or something like this. So here you can say, well, I want to see only critical errors. I want to see things like that. I want to see all errors. And you can see it's quickly filtered so you can see, have an idea, you know, I'm only interested in the error that I'm getting. Now you can also take an additional file. You can have that open. Let me grab a big one here, like this one here. I think I was playing around with this to generate errors and I think I have a big one. So I can drop it in there. Now some log files may take a little bit longer to load, but it will load this one here. So this is such a huge entrance here. I think I purposely stopped some content servers, some uh, workload servers. I don't know what the case might be, but I can also see here what information that if you click on this filtering options again, you can narrow down this the search or the display by a specific category. So that's something that came in six. 610 and it's available for you to be able to narrow down these issues here and dock your system. Okay, so that will be now also in addition information. Now all the services, document services will write information to this location, to the central location. Now also there's additional information such as in the event viewer. So by default document will try to write to the event viewer. If maybe it has no rights, then we'll write in this location. So if I go here to, let me go to administrative tools, administrators, so administrator tools, hold on a second. Let me go to control panel, administrator tools, event viewer. This is also the other location where you, you know, the system will write event logs or errors to this location. Like here, this is something like, is there something with the workflow engine? The workflow engine can be started. Maybe it's looking for it. Maybe it's not starting. See, it's starting. It's trying to connect the SQL Server returns as a and able to fill login. But that's why I done this purposely. Okay. Now, this is the server side. Let's look at the client side. What if we have issues with the client side? How do we collect information on the client side? In the client side, we have what we call log collector. So if I go down here, again, this comes with document. I'm going to open up document again. Let me close a couple of things here. Open up Explorer again. So we start fresh. Go to C drive, program files, document, desktop. And here we have a folder called log collector. In this log collector, we have an executable again. This allows you to gather information from your desktop apps such as printer, scanner, import, you know, a smart on it, things like that. If you have issues with those particular modules, those particular programs, this will be the tool that you want to use to be able to gather information, either submit with a ticket or a support request or things of that nature. This is a very good tool to be able to catch those error messages. Now, this particular log collector, not only we gather docker log errors or log data, but also gather information about the environment, such as system information. It will also go to the event viewer and gather some information from the event viewer, from the Windows Windows event viewer. So I purposely, I did this for a presentation. I'm going to show you where is the, I think it's on my desktop. Uh, let me go here, desktop, DW logs. This is the type of file you're going to get. The reason I'm not running right now because it takes a little bit to run, you know, because it got this information from the system and it got information about the whole environment. If I go into this location, there's a log data, there's my capture services. So if you have an issue, something with them, maybe with scanning, the scan or capturing something, you know, you can look at this. Is. If you have issues with desktop imports, desktop uh, not processing documents or things of that nature, you can look at these logs here. And also, if you have issues with printers, it captures those things. Also, there is application log. This comes from the event, event viewer. This comes from the system event viewer information, two areas. And also, we have system information. Like, you know, this is good for 
technical administrative people that to be able to see, well, let me look at the hardware. Maybe the reason it's taking this long is because there's enough resources and things of that nature. You know, you can look at the system information and see what, what, where is document installed, the environment. Okay, so this is what we have for the client side. All right, I'm going to close a couple of things here. Okay, now what if you're not interested in those? As an administrator, maybe you want to catch additional information about, about information, about maybe tracking users' activity. Maybe, maybe you want to see who's accessing the documents, who's printing the documents, things of that nature. In document administration, this is the document administration, we have three areas where you can catch this. We have the system level, we have the organization level, and each of those has what we call a login agent. Login agents where you create and you specify what do you want to track, what sort of activities. Like this login agent is for the organization level. This will track an example like if you create a new cabinet, if you create a new user, things of that nature. But that might not be so interesting for us, you know. Maybe you might be interested in the third login agent which lives inside the file cabinet. I go to file cabinets, document pool, go to options, and you have this login agents and destinations here. Okay. This is what you specify. I purposely created this. I prepared this for this webinar. Created a login agent which is generating an XML file. Now, to be able to use this, there's a couple of things you have to do before you do that. Either you create a storage location if you intend this to generate a file. If you are intended to create, to store this data in the database, then you will create a database connection because you're going to be storing data in the database. Once you have those two, either a database connection or a storage location, then you will create a destination. Destination says, well, where am I going to be storing the logs that are going to get generated by the agents? Like this one here, I'm using this, I'm putting this purposely in an XML file. Okay, so if I go here, that will be the location. So in the agents where you specify what do you want to track from with, within this agent. So for demonstration purposes, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to do a quick search, maybe document pool. Okay, I'm going to search something, maybe this. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm not feeling that good. So I'm going to delete this just to demonstrate what's going on here. Oh, object, okay. Not, not so good. Let me try something. Let me try changing something. Again, we were preparing this machine for do that. Let me see. One T. Save it. Okay, it's saved. Now, the, I created a login agent that goes to the C drive. It goes to, I think it's web, webinar location, and this is XML. I'm going to open up with uh, Notepad++. Once I open, towards the bottom. Let me see if I can find it. 1T, right? Find it. It's somewhere here. And you can see this is the cabinet that was assigned. And this is where the changes are being made. What was before and what was now. So with the login destination, you can you know push the data to a database, an XML file, or a flat file. So that's what's available for this login agents from the administration tool. I purposely did it into an XML file. So in summary, we have the client side, you know, where the log lives, which is the temp directory. I think this is location here. Let's see, temp. This is will be the location where all the default logs lives. I think it's this one here. Oops. The temp location, docker, this is the logs for the client side. And then we have the server side, which is again program data. This is the server side. That's where all the logs for docker service log lives. Okay? And then we have the log collector for the client side to go to collect you know deep information about the system. And again also we have you know things built in with an administration tool that allows you to collect log data if you desire to go a little bit more deeper into the document level as well. Okay. You can also go to our website and in our solution center, faq.document.com, you know, search for how to enable login or debug lab or things of that nature and you will be able to find some additional information on that. All right, moving on to my next topic. 
Well, let's go talk a little bit about another social sheet here. Yes, we can close that one. Let's talk about a specific file. Let's talk about a file is called, let me go back to the location first, I'm show you what I'm talking about here in a minute, program data, it's called dwmachine.config. This machine lives on the program data, docker, and lives under the server config, this, this file here. Why is the file so important? The file is important because now that the services were utilized, but also some additional components like a connect to mail, like a workflow engine, things like that. They use the file to identify and to find out the resources where they're supposed to be connecting. I'm going to open up this file. Let's see what we have here. This is the information that you found. This file was introduced in version 6.9 and it has been adding a few more things in version 6.10 uh, and in, in future versions as well. It might be adding more. This is the only part, this is with the only three lines of XML code that you will be able to find in this file. System server, the password, and the address of the document server where platform lives and things of that nature. So, but in version 6.10, we added a few more things. We added like, what database type are we going to be connecting? It could be an Oracle database, it could be a MySQL database, and things of that nature. Database server. The database server, the machine they're connecting, the port, the username, the password, the database name, and, and the database connection ID. So this information is held up here. Now, this machine, the W server machine, it's very important. Now, this is the unique system, the unique Docker system name or account that Docker creates during the installation. For every machine, it will be unique. So in other words, if you take a database from all the machine, from all this, you know, from a backup, from another server, try to reinstall it here and try to restart the services, this will not start because the user account will not exist on the database. So this is also registered on the database. Okay. Now, this particular path is also important. This particular path, you can gather this information We'll open up docker administration here for you. Okay, we can go here to web connections. Under the web connections, we have what we call the web connections list, and here we have the internal location. There will be times where you may have to use an external address, which should be okay, but you know it's always suggested as a best practice to use an internal address instead of an external address. You know, for the best practice only. Now you say, well, how do we fix this? If this is broken, how do we fix this? Okay, to be able to fix this, remember this file gets created during the installation. I'm going to close a couple things here. So to be able to fix this, what you can do is, if maybe you copy the database from another machine, maybe you're reinstalling, whatever the case might be, or maybe it just is broken. So how do we fix this? You can say, well, you can rename whatever's in there. I'm going to do it to original, for example. So you can run the setup, any kind of setup. You know, either take one thing out, put it back in there, or things of that nature. So if I do that, I'm going to open up another one here. Just don't lose that one in there. Explorer. If I go here to C drive, document 610. If I run a setup, it will create the new file. So in order to fix this, you run the setup and it will create it up for you. So I'm going to run very quickly here and see if it comes up. Okay, next. Let's put the password for the database. Let's select the database type. Service system, I think that should be fine. Let's put the old good Peters Engineering, Peters Engineering, and the username and password, of course. Let's go to next. See what we have here. Okay, so to be able to fix it, we're going to take something out. Let's take, uh, I don't know, thumbnail service. Thumbnail service is generally thumbnail. It's not a critical service application, but let's see what we have. We go next, install, and we'll see in the background here, as soon as it starts finishing runs, it will create a machine that config. Okay, so now if the service won't start or, you know, now we will start because now it has a new file. Okay. Now, OK, 
Okay, so there we go. That's how we fix the messages. Now, let's go back here. I'm going to start the service. Start the service control here. Let me see what I have here. Okay, now I'm going to show you what happens if something is broken. I'm going to take this out. Okay. Okay. I don't suggest doing that, but I'm going to kill it because I'm in a time crunch here. Give me a second here. Okay. So what happens if I go here and I just say, well, this is new. Okay. What's going to happen? If I go here, try to start, it won't start. What do we do when one doesn't start? You check the event viewer. You also go to, you can go one level up here and go to the log files. Maybe somewhere in an dedication server, there is an, there is an error message. Let me make this bigger. And go to the bottom, maybe. See? It's complaining about something about configuration errors, something about this config not found. You know, it's, it's something is missing. Okay? So, service won't start. And that's the reason you will, you know, go and fix it. Okay, you can copy this from the machine. We also have, you know, to be able to address this. You, know, you may ask, you know, what components should be there? We also have an FAQ article that you can go look at it and see what should be there. FAQ.oculate.com. I'm going to show you something here. Here we just type 47, 40. Okay, this is an FAQ article. It tells you how to fix the, this file if it's corrupted or not. So that gives you an idea what should be there and what shouldn't be there. If things are missing, you know, check against this file, check against this article. It will tell you what needs to be fixed and how to fix it and things like that. Okay? So I'm going to come back here with my original bag. Okay? Uh, if I can go here, server config, put my original bag. And I should get up and running in no time. Again, as a best practice, you know, if you're fixing something, always have a backup. Make a copy of it, you know, backup with a backup, that kind of thing. So that way you can always come back and, you know, compare the two files and things like that. Okay? So that's the DW machine that config. It's a very important file. You should always, you know, look at it. If you have, you know, don't just copy the database from one server to another, restore it, and things that are working is not going to work. Remember, also, this file has all the database connection information. Authentication server will look at the file and will say, well, where is the file? Is all information that I need within the file, you know, like the database information, things like that. Okay. Now, moving on to the next topic. Let me close this here. I can close it. No. Okay. I'm going to run this in the background. Let's see. How to identify and fix upgrade issues. Now, that's my next topic. From time to time, also, again, now you may have some issues with the upgrades. How do we fix it? Especially we're talking about file cabinet upgrades. You know, there have been a couple of scenarios where you have massive cabinets. We're talking in the millions of rows and things of that nature. You know, a lot of data. From time to time, you know, SQL Server or application will say, well, I cannot wait enough because SQL Server is still doing what needs to be done on the database. And there will be time up issues. So in 6, 6, 9 or older, we will be where we have to increase on top of the timeouts. There's also an FAQ article and things like that. But in 6.10, those things have been addressed and it should not have the issue anymore. Okay? Now, to be able to demonstrate if you have issues with such uh, large cabinets in the database, I'm just going to open up my database here just to show you. Let's go back here for a second. I'm going to go back to admin. Here, you don't have to know all about this, but just in case you're wondering where I'm going, I'm going to the location where the file cabinets are located. There's a DW sys table here. If I look at here, right click on it, maybe I'm going to return top thousand rows, for example, okay? Okay, you will see that all the way at the last column where it says what? Some cabinets wasn't updated successfully, okay? 610, see that one? There's only one cabinet that was updated 610, the other ones are 68. Maybe because they were in the millions and SQL Server couldn't perform the task that was supposed to do. Because in every upgrade, it is going to add columns, it's going to modify data, it's going to insert data. You know, whatever needs to be restructured, it has to be restructured. And, and if it's massive data living in the database, you know, this will take time. And sometimes the application can wait for it. Okay. So let's go here and see 
how do we fix this? Now, to be able to fix this, we have to run, we have a tool built in into Docura, and we call it Content Server Upgrader Tool. Okay? Now, to be able to run this, I'm going to stop this. Stop this. The reason I'm stopping is because it uses the same port to connect to the database. Okay? Now, <clears throat> before I even do this, let's start this for a second here. I'm going to show you something. Now, you may encounter some of these. You run the you run the upgrade, things work fine. Suddenly, when you go to retrieve documents, this is what you need. Something similar like this. I'm going to log in into the web client, show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so you go here. I'm going to retrieve documents from P documents. Go to retrieve a document. Content fail, whatever the case may be. Content fail. Or you may get the columns are missing or things of that nature. Like, uh, let's see. Document pool, I think, was working okay. The content fail too. Okay, I think it's time to do something with my services. Okay. I'll see what's going on in a minute, but this is the idea is that here when you do a retrieve a document, you get an error message that says, you know, columns are missing, table structure is missing, or you get a message that says it needs to be upgraded to a new version or something like that. Okay? So if that's the case, you go check the database. When you check the database, you find out that, you know, tables, some tables were not upgraded successfully. So in this case, what we're going to do is here, I'm going to stop content server. Now I'm going to stop content server. Okay. Then I'm going to go to a location, C drive, program files, docuware. Let's go down to content server. I'm going to sort by type. There you go. It's called docuware content server operator. Now this, as soon as I run this. Now before you run, don't just click on and run it and be good with that. No. Well, what I want you to do is, before you run this, go check this location here. Of course, now I have some issues with my, because I was playing around with the services. I think I have to refresh everything. If you go here, check the, the database connections that the file candidates are assigned to. If you notice here, this is going to the DW data, and some cabinets are using this database connection. What happens if you're taking the database from a X server, whatever server, old server, or maybe you're replicating or something like that, or maybe you're testing the upgrade, I don't know, and you forgot to change this, and the other server is still alive, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to be upgrading or modifying data on this server. Danger, okay? So be careful before you run this. Check the database connections of candidates are assigned to it, and then run this. I mean, right now, you can always go here before you run it, and it's the best practice. Select the database connection, check accessibility, and see if it's accessible. Accessible, yes. Okay? I mean, do that for all the connections that you have for assigned to cabinets. Once you do that, verify the information is correct, and run this guy here. This goes to the database. My such a small system, it runs very quickly, but sometimes you know, it might take longer. And here, if I execute this again, it's just a simple select statement. Now we have 610 on it. I'm sorry about this message here. It keeps coming up, popping up. I'm going to close this, maybe. Okay? So that's upgrading the system for the content server. So to be able to summarize this, I mean, Docker has a built-in tools that you can, you know, fix any, any issues that you have with the upgrade. We also, you know, if you have something critical going on, you know, also feel free to create a case. You know, feel free to say, hey, I have issues with this, and we will help you, and we gladly help you with that as well. Also, check the Knowledge Center. The Knowledge Center or the Solution Center, and also has information about, you know, things like upgrading. You know, just type the keyword upgrade and things by like nature. A couple, a couple of the FAQ articles, I think, is here that you can look at it. FAQ.acura.com. Let me see. Remind you of this. This is 4340. I think this is a how to increase the timeout that we're talking about for version 6, 9 or older, you know, how to increase the timeout so that way when you run the operator tool, you know, it will run successfully, okay? Okay, um, with this, this concludes my part of my presentation. I hope you were able to gather some information for your administrative tasks. Thanks for participating in this webinar. Now I'm going to pass to, to 
Matthias. Back Matthias, to me. Take it over. Thanks a lot, Juan, for these great tips and tricks. I have seen during your session there were a lot of questions coming in, so Gerardo monitored them in the background. We have answered well, nearly all of them directly. Gerardo, what were the yeah. most important ones? Well, we had a couple of them. Um, I just picked now three or four. So the first one is since which version DW log view exists and is it backward compatible? Uh, yes, it is. It exists in 6.10, but it also works with the uh, older versions of Docker, yes. All the older logs. Okay, cool. And then um, about the log collector for the desktop apps, um, do we need to download that or is it built in? It's a built in, it's a built -in application that comes with Docker desktop, starting with uh, I think 6.9, if I'm not correcting, or 6.8 as well. But it, it, it's a log collector. Okay, and last question was uh, about the FAQ articles. Um, how do we know the numbers you, all about this FAQ articles you showed? The FAQ articles usually I know you can just type it in. It's not a, you know, if you search by, you can also narrow down by category if you want to. Let's say I'm going to look at all, you know, versions with 6.10 or something. If you know a phrase, you know, then the docker, the search engine here will look at the title first, you know, and get as close as you can. You can all put a wild card into the engine, but I know by heart. And you can also narrow down by categories and things like that. Okay, okay. Yeah. may I add something? So we also will publish a list of the FAQ articles we used here in the webinar, and we suggest for solving these kind of problems later after the webinar in our support forum. So Gerardo, was it the last question from your side? Yes, so far. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Okay, please proceed asking any kind of questions in the webinar in the question area. We will still try to answer them all. Um, during the session. All questions and all answers, especially the we, these we cannot answer today, will be published after the webinar, uh, also on our support forum. So before we come to the second tips and tricks session, I want to know a bit more about you. I have to speed up a bit because we are still a bit over time, already a bit over time. I've prepared a short poll for you. So um, I want to know a bit more about you. I want to know what is your DocuWare role? What is your DocuWare profession? So are you a DocuWare system consultant, a DocuWare application consultant, a DocuWare administrator, or a DocuWare power user, or a just a DocuWare fan? So you can click directly inside this um, go to webinar window and select the matching answer. So a lot of you are voting already. We've got already 50% votings. That's nice. I'm just waiting some seconds to get some more votes. Then I will share the result with you. Okay, 70%. That should be enough. Thanks a lot for your answers. I will close the poll and share the results with you. Well, quite interesting. As we expected, a lot of DocuWare system consultants from our partners outside are in here, but also a lot of administrators. It's really nice to see. Thanks a lot for your participation. This uh, feedback will help us a lot to find our focus also for the next webinars and to, prove, to improve the content in the future. And now it's time for the second tips and tricks session. Hello, Sebastian. Um, it's your turn now. Okay. Thank you, Matthias. So I will directly share my screen. Just a second. Um, so, so now you should see my screen. Okay, perfect. So we will directly start with the first topic. It's um, yeah, desktop performance and how to increase it. So for the first thing, what I want to show you is the um, just a normal upload of yeah, via Docker desktop import. Um, we're just importing some documents without and we, we haven't done any performance increase yet. We will do that afterwards. So just to show you how fast it is if you don't do any performance increase. Okay, so um, while this is uploading, we will have a look at a small picture um, 
which explains how Docker Desktop works or what are the different parts, parts of the different main modules of Docker Desktop, which are the printer, import, and web scan. And you see, as you see, every module has its different part. The printer does print via drop folder, then it runs into the drops folder. The import directly imports it from the monitored folder to the drops folder. And the Docker web scan has a temp folder between the jobs folder, it's just called the scanner temp. Um, you can find this temp folder for every user in the yeah, t um, local temp of every user which starts the desktop apps. So, but the interesting thing about the performance is the jobs folder here. So, you already can see it in that little picture. There are two different job, jobs folders that only um, is or occurs or is part if you install the Docker client, so the desktop apps on a different machine and the server side, the job server on another machine. So on every machine, client side and server side, there will be a jobs folder. Of, and as you can yeah, think maybe, if you have these two jobs folders, the data has be, to be transferred from the client to the chop um, to the chops folder on the server, so that also takes some time and also network load. Um, so the best, the better um, thing or best practice would be if you only run Docker import to install everything on one machine on a server, and because then if you install it just on one machine, the, um, the chop server and also the desktop service will just share the chops folder. So as you see in the background, we are already done by uploading. So we started, if we just refresh it first at 11.39 till now, 11.42, so it take, took us up, yeah, three minutes, maybe a little bit more because we can't see the seconds. So, but about three minutes. Um, just come back shortly to the picture again. So as I mentioned, it's if you're only using Docker import, just keep in mind to install Docker desktop service, so it will be installed with the desktop apps and the job server on the same machine because then we share the jobs folder and we don't have to transfer anything. Okay, so now we can just go on and improve the performance. So the fir first thing we will do is to have a look directly in our import configuration. So we will use for a second upload, of course, the exactly same configuration. The only thing we will do is to enable this checkbox here. It just says, um, yeah, run automatic text and barcode recognition only if required. What does that mean? When is it required? It's all the time required if you go to the splitting tab or indexing tab and if you are just tracking a barcode zone here on the left side or a text zone on your document, then it's required. So you can decide if both are required or only one. So in our import configuration, we only read out a barcode and also splitting via this barcode. So just let's save and close this configuration. That's the first thing we do to improve our, our performance. The other thing we want to do, just let's open our so-called override file. So, um, it's not built in. We have to copy that files into our desktop installation folder. So I will you all, um, also show after I explained it where you can get this and these files. It's quite simple. You just can download them via FAQ. So let's just let's now have a look into the both files. There's one file for the document desktop exe config. It's just called ex, uh, desktop exe config dot overrides, and another one for the desktop service exe config. So we will have a look just after this file. So what we will change to improve the performance is um, change the train notification level. So the default is info. So that's why we also got any uh, got an, um, messages down here from the desktop icon when all the um, documents were imported successfully. So we now change it just to warning. So we will only be notified if a document runs into a warning or into an error. So that just decreases the performance the Docker desktop apps are need. And in the other file for the desktop service config file, we have two keys. 
we will yeah, add with this file. The first one is the concurrency maximum. This key just defines how many jobs or on, on how many jobs the Docker desktop um, service works parallel. So the default is two and we just set it to eight. So you don't should just set it to an enormous high value because it has to be with your course you have. So just find a good value. So eight normally is a really good value if you have about four or eight, yeah, four cores maybe, maybe or six cores. So if you have even more, you could also set it higher. So the other um, key is the NQ limit. The NQ limit is um, defines the queue of the Docker desktop. So the Docker desktop service has a queue where he just uploads documents to work on. And then I think the default value is 10 as far as I know. It's, yeah, it's 10. And with this um, key, you can just increase it up to 50. It's really important to know that you don't should uh, you, or you're not allowed to put it higher than 100 because if the, if the Docker desktop service loads too many documents into the queue, it can be a um, yeah, negative effect of the performance. So exactly the difference you want to achieve with that key. So now, so the experience we had, if you set it just to 50, that's quite enough. So maybe it's just some words about the queue again. So as I said, the Docker desktop service has this queue. He loads the documents into it to work on it. So why, it, why it's important to set it higher than 10? Um, it's important because, just a small example, if you would have the default value, we would load in 10 documents. Um, this 10 documents would be uploaded in 10 seconds, for example. Um, and the queue is just reloaded um, after a hard-coded time. So it's 30 seconds as far as I know. So the problem would be then that we would have 20 seconds of a waiting state so Docker Desktop Service would not upload anything. So just a short view into the FAQ I mentioned. You see you have the same picture we had a look at in that FAQ with the a description again and also some other yeah, interesting things you can do to increase the performance. Of course, enough resources, a fast um, drive, then that's quite important. Um, just exclude the Docuware um, folders and also the Docuware URL from the um, antivirus protection. Import from local folders, so if it's possible, don't use network folders to to um, import. So it's just in here. All all the time, try to use local folders because that's also much faster. Because we don't have to transfer the documents to the server first. It's local everything. Then we had a look at this. The um, yeah, the enable checkbox, and that's just one of what I wanted to show. That's the download link to get the override files. So, but now, enough from in the theoretic side, let's do um, the tuning. So, we stop the desktop service and also the Docker desktop apps. We are copying the both files into the desktop folder. I have just a shortcut here. So, the, because the really good thing about the override files um, we have them since 6.9 is even if you do an upgrade of your Docker versions, the overrides files will stay there and you don't have to do the um, adaptions a second time. You only have to do it once. So we start the desktop again. I just want to have it here that we see that it's really faster. We are copying the files again into the monitored folder. And now you should see that it's going much faster till it's uploading. You see already there are more circles on the documents in the before there were three at maximum. So the circles just showing you that um, the Docker desktop service or the Docker desktop is currently working on these documents. The numbers in the middle of the document just show you into how many documents um, the, the original document were splitted. So we have two 
some some documents were split in two new diff documents, other one in three, and other ones just will stay yeah, as they were before. And maybe you can see it also under the document there's sometimes a gray loading bar. That means that it's uploaded. So you see it's much faster. We already done, just let wait a little bit longer. So we already finished. So as we see, we started at 11.49 and it only took us about one minute to upload. So it's maybe a little bit more than 50% faster than without our performance tuning. Okay, with that, let's come to the next topic. I just will clean a little bit my screen. The next topic is also, oh, we also will start with another picture. It's about the client usage. So I just will show you something first. So that's the modules which all needs a client license. So if you are logging into one of these modules, um, the, the uh, Docker user will use a client license. So there, but one user of, can log in on one machine with, with using only one client license on all of these um, Docker modules. The important thing is that it's the same user and on the same machine. Of course, there's one yeah, um, exception. If you're using a mobile um, device, of course, that could be another um, device than so a um, smartphone or whatever. Then there's one more thing you have to keep in mind. If a Docker user would work on one machine and he would use more than one browser. So for example, Internet Explorer and Firefox, it would take him two licenses. So please keep in mind if, you, if you're working in, dif uh, in different tabs or whatever, for, for example, you have opened the web client and you also open a UL integration, it should be opened in the same browser to be, to be on that only one client license is used. Okay, so now I just will log into some modules, then we will have a look. We have an overview how many um, users are logged in. We can open that in a Docker administration, so we are logged in to the web client at the administrator. And let's use this to log into our Windows Explorer client also as the admin user. And we use a second browser, the Google Chrome, to just log in as Peggy Jenkins here. And after we logged in it, as Peggy Jenkins, we just directly log out that I can show because I can show you then how that will be look like in the connection overview. So that's the connection overview up here. You can open it with that button or with the shortcut Control P. So just to be have a better overview, switch to the radio button license and hover over the license type column here because then you have here this filter option, just click on it and select cli and dock your client because these are the important licenses because these are the um, user, um, licenses which are the um, users, users if they log into the modules. So we see here that um, user admin is logged in into the web client and in the, to the Windows Explorer client you can see it in the application column but in the last column you see he only uses one license. For Peggy Jenkins, you see she also uses one license because she is logged in, in, the, web, in the web client. And because we just directly logged out again, you see it in the um, column license and use until it's set to 11.55. That means after logging out from a module, the license is taken one, uh, two more minutes. So it's kind of blocked for that time. But if would if put, um, Peggy Peng, sorry Peggy Jenkins would log in again, she would use the same license. But for other um, users, it's blocked for two more minutes. But after that time, also other users could use it. Um, so maybe you can just wait a little bit longer um, to see because and to see what happens after that time. So when the um, license is getting free again because that's quite important also to know um, 
this window we can see here is not refreshing manually. So if now would another person would log in or log out, so the client license is free again, um, it's not refreshed automatically. You have to hit the refresh button and you see the license of Peggy Jenkins is given free again. So that's quite nice just to see how many people are logged in and um, yeah, what module they're using. Just let's close that things. So that module, of course, can be used if you just want to check where all your licenses are gone. So we have to close that to minimize the administration. And let's go to the last thing for today. It's the message bus. Um, the message bus is um, yeah, it's used by the Docker services. You can see also on this picture. So. It's used from almost all Docker servers and also from a lot of um, application pools of Docker, so from the job server, for example, platform services, which is mainly used for the, yeah, or which is also used for the web client. So, and the message bus is just a component from Microsoft, which are used by us, and it's kind of, um, message queues, as, as the name says, um, and do, the, all the document components just sending message into th these queues. And they are not also s um, um, only sending messages to the queues, they're also reading the, reading the messages from these queues. So just to um, explain a little bit, this message bus is kind of used like an internal chat between the different um, document components. So the different Docker components, just informing the other components if there are any changes in, in any input configuration or, for example, to inform the platform that um, a new document is into the web, um, was uploaded into the webbasket and has to be refreshed. So I just will show you that um, because sometimes it happens that the refreshing is not working anymore. So you will find a tool to reset, if, if that happens, you will find a tool to reset the message bus administration. So in the setup components folder, which will be created if you're installing Docuware, um, you will find this Docuware message bus administration exe. Please start it all the time at administrator. And now I will show you with this, you have to be carefully, so it's not really that you can break something, but if if it happens you have to you have to reset the MSMQ because you see now you can see all the messages which are sent from the different Docker components and you also see that the cursor is directly in this drop down menu up here so if you now would change uh, use the mouse wheel you would change the network adapter to default default network adapter that's the adapter we um, we need and use and there are also some other adapters. You see, I just show with you, show want to presentate it. If I just switch the um, a network adapter or also to that one, there are not any messages sent. Now we would now it the message bus is not working any longer. I just want to demonstrate that quickly. So we put the client on the right side, maybe and just upload the document. One is enough. Just import document to the default tray. So already was taken. You see it here in the desktop apps. It's uploaded, but you see it's not in the web basket, just let close all these windows. Up down here, it's a refresh button. If I just hit it, the document will appear. So that's maybe one case what could happen or can happen. If, if you see any other um, refreshing problems in the web client, just reset the MSMQ. I just show you now how you can reset it. If you want to reset the MSMQ, you have to stop all the Docker services using the service control. Just stop it. What you also see, if you're using the SAP HTTP server, please keep in mind that 
these, this service not in the service control, you have to stop it via the, doc, and the Windows services. So I don't have it installed on that machine. So, but on the other side, I also have to stop the application pools or the whole IIS. I just stop the IIS2 and also the Docker service control. So when it's now stopped, we can just reset. So it stopped, now we can reset the um, MSMQ. We just switch it back to the default network adapter, hit the button, remove all message queues. We get a list which message queues will be removed. We say OK and just close the message bus administrator again. Or just, just let it open. Normally, please close it before, but I now let it open for demonstration reasons. You see, as the servers are starting, we will get back the messages. So I just close it now, start the IIS again. And afterwards, we can just upload one more document to the WebBasket. Now it should be directly yeah, reloaded. Just take the same document. Let's see if all yeah, all the services are started. Just put it in here. Docu desktop is already working on this new document. Still need a little bit. So maybe you're thinking why it's taking now that long? Because we just use the default upload connection. It's called inbox for this document or for this um, import configuration all the time the um, text dot is created. So no, that's what normally should not happen for any, for any reason that the refresh does not work. So in our test it worked all the time. So now I would, I would, would have to just um, close or stop the um, servers again. Also the application pools and to reset, I had to reset the message bus again. So maybe it was because it didn't close the message bus directly. So that's what I said, just close the message bus before you start everything again. Then there's just one thing I want to mention. If you are want to, if you want to change the user of your services, you also have to restart the message bus administrator after to stop the services also keep it, also stop the um, application pools because the docker service services and the application pools have to be run with the same user so if you are changing the user for the services you also have to change them for the application pools okay so with that i'm done and i will hand over back to matthias Thank you, Sebastian, for these really techy hinds. So, again, some questions came in. So, Gerardo, what have we got? Yeah, there were a couple of questions coming in. <clears throat> so, one is, are these overrides done on the server or on the client? So, where they have to put in is in the Docker Desktop install folder. So, it could be on the client, but it also could be on the on the server machine. It's depending where. Let's just switch back to the picture. So it's depending where you have installed the Docker desktop apps or the desktop service. So just put it into the Docker desktop install folder. But the files you can download in the FAQ, they are optimized for using it to run on the, on a server. All right. Okay. Then we have. <clears throat> Two questions regarding the licenses. The first one is, does Docker Print the user client license? Okay, thanks. No, so Docker Printer and Docker Import are not using any client licenses, um, and also WebScan does not. The only thing, are, for example, um, Smart Smart Connect or Smart Index or uh, Smart Search, because it's using an URL integration, it's using yeah, a client license, but not the main modules we see on this um, picture, all of them are not using a client license. Thanks. And uh, is there any chance to see in the license monitor which IP address or machine name is, is the user? 
as far as I know, it's not. So it's oh, that's because I started my services. So but um, no, because we can't. So we can't see from which machine the web client is open. That's not possible. Okay, then um, one question regarding the MSMQ. Um, does Docker Desktop Service also use that message queues? Um, no, so the Docker Desktop Service is not using um, the message queues. That's also the reason why this server, so the Docker Desktop Service, can run with a different user. So that the default user there is the um, local, um, yeah, local machine user. So that's the reason why it's possible. So it's not using. Right, then that's it for now. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Gerardo. Thanks, Sebastian, and thank you for your questions. Before we are finishing the webinar, I will take back the control because I have some more or some important information for you because now we need your feedback. At the end of the webinar, uh, a short survey will pop up. So we want to know how do you rate this webinar today and what was the most valuable content for you today. And very important, please tell us also which kind of topics you would like to have in the next webinar. Thank you for your feedback ideas and your time in advance. So as a last note from my side, during the next days we will publish also a recording of this webinar and a list with um, our your questions, our answers and the FAQs, as I've mentioned, we have used during this webinar. This all will be published in, the, in our support forum. I want to thank you also in the name of my colleagues for your participation in this first Tips and Tricks webinar. I really hope you enjoyed it and you've got a lot of personal useful information for you. Have a Merry Christmas and see you next year. Goodbye. <laughs>